Hashimoto's patients need to be on the lookout for celiac disease. Now, why is that? Because Hashimoto's patients are at risk, we know, for developing other autoimmune conditions. I've already talked about gastritis and rheumatoid arthritis, and today we're talking about celiac disease. I'm going to define what that is. I'm going to give you kind of my unique take on whether it matters if you have celiac disease or not, and what testing can be done, and what you should do about it, because Hashimoto's patients are at risk for this, so we need to talk about it. So let's get into it. So Hashimoto's patients are at risk for other autoimmune conditions. If Hashimoto's wasn't bad enough, you know, causing brain fog and depression and anxiety and weight gain and all that stuff, you can get other autoimmune problems and celiac disease is one of those. Now, I personally have celiac disease, so anything I'm going to tell you today, I've lived it. So let's talk about what is celiac disease kind of by definition. Well, by definition, it's a genetic predisposition to having a problem with wheat, barley, and rye. And if you dig down a little bit deeper, what they're saying is that you've got a genotype that makes you reactive to wheat, barley, and rye. It just so happens that Hashimoto's and celiac disease are genetically linked. They're very, very similar genetically. And that's why so many people with Hashimoto's have a problem with wheat. Now, I'm going to kind of get ahead of myself a little bit and say, I don't really care if we call it celiac disease or non-celiac wheat sensitivity. The bottom line is you either do or do not have a problem with wheat and you either can or cannot eat wheat. So that being said, by definition, celiac disease causes small intestine damage due to uh, this immune system reactivity. But the symptoms that it causes are much farther and beyond just the GI tract. And that's something a lot of people don't realize. You know, like intuitively, you think celiac disease, it's a gut thing, it must cause diarrhea and bloating, and that's how I would know if I had it. That's not correct. Because it does affect the small intestine, you can get nutrient deficiencies, such as iron problems, ferritin, folic acid, vitamin D, B12, but not have a problem with bloating or diarrhea or an obvious reaction when you eat wheat. Now, some people do get that, but a lot of people don't. And the research has shown that the intestinal symptoms versus extra intestinal symptoms, that ratio uh, is about eight to one over extra intestinal versus intestinal. That's a big surprise to most people. And the reason you get these extra intestinal symptoms is because one of the things that happens in celiac disease is what makes it an autoimmune condition is that you begin making antibodies to something called tissue transglutaminase or transglutaminase number two. And that's in your GI tract. But transglutaminase two also can, the antibodies for that can cross react with transglutaminase number three, which is in your skin. So some people that have celiac disease can get skin problems. Uh, sometimes it's acne, sometimes it's something called uh, herpetiform lesions. But also, you can cross-react with transglutaminase number six, and that's in your nervous system. So people with celiac disease can get migraines, they can get neuropathy, they can have a whole host of symptoms that are not GI symptoms, right? It's very important we realize that. What about testing for celiac disease? And there's a little bit of controversy here. Some of the people that are still living in the old school say, well, you have to have a biopsy of your small intestine where we go in and we look under the microscope and if we see certain uh, evidence of like blunting of the villi and lymphocytic infiltration, you've got celiac disease. Other people have said, look, you don't really have to do that because we've got these antibody tests that we've done that seem to be really sensitive or sensitive enough and specific enough for people that have actual celiac disease. Those are tests like uh, tissue transglutaminase antibodies, uh, anti-endomesial antibodies, anti-vimentin antibodies. I'll tell you this though, the little, my issue with that is, yes, you may have those antibodies and they may be associated with celiac disease, meaning a certain genotype, but I honestly really don't care if we call it celiac disease or not. Why? Because the issue is whether you can or cannot eat wheat, right? You either do or do not have an immune system reaction. So can you do those tests? Fantastic. But just because you do a celiac test, right? and it's negative, that doesn't mean you can't eat gluten. That's a mistake because a poodle is a dog, right? But not all dogs are poodles. Same thing with celiac disease. Celiac disease is a type of problem with wheat, but it is not the only problem. We now have this whole other thing that we call non-celiac wheat sensitivity, which means it may not be uh, that same genotypic uh, basis for your sensitivity, or it may not cause, by definition, small intestine damage, but you still have a problem with wheat. Now, how do you test for that? Well, the testing I do when someone wants to find out, hey, can I eat wheat or not? And I have another thing to say about that. As I do this panel here, this is Array 3X from Cyrex Lab. Again, guys, I don't have any financial interest. They don't give me any money or anything. 
But this test, I think, is the best test we can do because it looks at all these different pieces of wheat, not just gliadin and not just tissue transglutaminase, but it will look at that and say, okay, if you're having a problem with whole wheat or alpha gliadin or uh, transglutaminase micro, uh, 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 complexes, you got reactions to any of those things, you have a problem with wheat. Now, of course, this test can also tell us if it's autoimmune, because remember, celiac disease by definition is autoimmune, and there has to be like endomesial antibodies or transglutamination you know, tissue antibodies, that's autoimmune. Well, we can look at that here as well. So, but here's the thing, I'm, I'm a little cat out of the bag here. I don't even do this test very much anymore because the simple fact is, so many people with Hashimoto's have got a gluten slash wheat problem. There's no point even doing this test because it's just going to show up positive. So let's save several hundred bucks and just do what's necessary. And I'm serious about that. I've had literally like one person in the last 20 plus years with Hashimoto's that could just at will eat whatever gluten they wanted and they had no problem. 99.9 .9 of everybody else could not do it. Okay, so let that sink in for a second. If you've got Hashimoto's, there's an extremely good chance you have a problem with wheat, whether you know it or not, whether you feel it in your GI tract or not. Now that we've talked about what celiac is, you know, what symptoms does it cause, which can be misleading, what testing can you do or, or not do, what do you do if you find out you've got celiac disease? Well, they're going to tell you you have to have a lifelong gluten-free diet, and that's true. I also think there's a thing you need to do where you avoid cross-reactors that we know cross-react with gluten. Now, cross-reaction just means that, you know, the antibodies that your immune system is making for the gluten and the gliadin, uh, those can stick onto other things like milk and corn. And I think how I do it is I try to get people to avoid those things as well. Because if you go from eating gluten-containing stuff to non-gluten things and you've got a leaky gut that's still in there, because that's one of the things that celiac disease likes to cause, uh, you can develop new sensitivity. So I don't want to get too deep into that, but what I'm telling you is make sure you are working with someone that understands the complexities that we've talked about today. Number one, that most people with Hashimoto's are going to have a problem with gluten, whether it's celiac or not, and that you probably ought to just be avoiding gluten for life anyway. But if you're going to test for it, what are the pitfalls with testing for celiac disease, right? Because remember the poodle metaphor. What other testing can you do? And then beyond that, what other things are going on with your Hashimoto's, right? Because uh, if you're still having symptoms, right? If, you, if your TSH is normal and your free T4 is normal, but you've got any of the symptoms I've talked about today, then you gotta be working with someone that knows how to, how to dig into that and be a detective and help you uh, come up with a, a support plan, a treatment plan to fix that stuff. So I hope you guys found that helpful and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.